Hi, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to a national COE DSCI's webinar on building elastic teams. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we have uh, Mr. Deepak Gupta. He's the client partner and executive coach for Corn Ferry. Hi, Deepak. Thank you for joining good morning. us. Hi, uh, we have uh, Ms. Kanika Chadda. She is the head of professional research at Corn Ferry. And we have Mr. Nikhil Khurana. He is the principal global technology mar markets for, from Corn Ferry. And uh, Mr. Rakshit is the senior consultant with Corn Ferry. Thank you so much, guys, for joining us today and uh, talking about a very interesting topic for the startups uh, building elastic teams, uh, helping startups to understand why this is so important to uh, to build an organizational structure right from the start so with this uh, i will be handing over to mr deepa and uh, just to give a heads up to all the uh, people who have joined us in the audience uh, you may put your questions in the questions tab on the right hand side and uh, we have last 15 minutes reserved for you guys to interact with our speakers you may raise your hand uh, there's an option second option on your right hand side and in between the session, if you want to share your sentiments, we have an emoticon section on the top through which you can express your sentiments to us so we can see if you're enjoying the session or not. With this, I would like to hand over to you, Deepak. Thank you. Thank you, Sonam. And good morning, everyone, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to this webinar. Sonam said, my name is yeah, Dr. Deepa Gupta. I do have a PhD in front of my name. Spent six years of my youth chasing this elusive dream. And I'm a clan partner with Conferry. Extremely happy to be here. Um, like to start off by thanking the DSCI team, which is Vinayak and Sonam, for giving Conferry this opportunity to meet this forum of uh, leaders and entrepreneurs of uh, expert companies in the cybersecurity space. Um, uh, let me start by introducing a bit about Conferry, and I promise you it's not going to be a long one. Um, some of you may know we are a global consulting firm with presence uh, across more than 100 markets globally and experience of working, and I say this with all humility, uh, with organizations of various scale and industries and um, proud uh, of being really serious partners to over 98 percent of the fortune 100 companies um importantly and that's important um, we help organizations select and hire talent they need to execute their strategy and we'll probably talk about and share some war stories as we go along and show them the best way to compensate develop and motivate their people because and and in fact, we say our tagline is that we help you execute your strategy. So it's a pleasure to be here. As Sonam said, um, I also have uh, I'm also privileged to have the company of two two of my partner colleagues, uh, Konika uh, Chada and Nikhil Khorana. Uh, just a quick uh, introduction, Konika, over to you, and then Nikhil. Thank you so much, Deepak. Hello, everybody. Pleasure to be here. Um, uh, you know, uh, we already know about the firm. So um, I've been here for the last seven and a half years. And I think I'm one example of a banker who turned into HR and Conferi turning me into a search consultant. Um, now we are here today with, uh, you know, some of this really budding people, uh, some of whom we have worked with. And I look forward to the session and learning some stuff from all of you as well. Thank you, Konika. Nikhil? Thanks, Deepak. Thanks, Konika. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, pleasure to be here this morning. Uh, as uh, Sonam mentioned, I'm a principal with Conferi's uh, leadership hiring practice. I focus specifically on the technology and communication sector. Um, I can relate to all of you very well this morning. Uh, 20 years ago, I started my career with Bell Labs as a R&D engineer. Uh, have, have moved on uh, since then, have spent the last 14 years as a management consultant, out of which about six years in the Silicon Valley, helping some of the iconic technology and telecom companies uh, transform and grow to new business models uh, focused on cloud, software as a service, and so on and so forth. Uh, like Konika mentioned, uh, you know, transitioned from being a management consultant uh, to a search consultant these days have been with the firm for uh, almost one and a half years now and look forward to an engaging session with all of you. Deepak, Thank back you, Nikhil. 
Yep. Thank you, Nikhil. And Mr. Basin, very quickly, he's the producer for this morning. Or maybe Mr. Basin has chosen to keep quiet. Well, um, so just a few housekeeping uh, thoughts. Uh, as you would expect, all phone lines will be muted, um, but you could raise your hand uh, in the last 15 minutes uh, that we've reserved for the question and answer sort of section of this one hour. Uh, a second point, a PDF version of the webinar slides will be uploaded and links sent out to you all who are participating. Um, and finally, use the chat or the Q&A feature on the right side of your screen to post your questions, clarifications, and of course, do use the emoticons. Sonam will track them and, we'll, and we will take these up in the last 15 minutes. So with that, let me come to um, what is it that we're going to be speaking about today. Uh, we, we hope to, and then that really is our endeavor, uh, share with you our point of view on three aspects. The first one is the need and the impetus to stay elastic, which is really the tagline for this webinar. Um, those of you, I understand it's a, a heterogeneous audience. Some of you represent the startup community, but some of you are from the academia and, and maybe other partners. Um, so those of you who are in 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 the startup space uh, in in this vertical you are growing at a rapid pace and 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 we sincerely hope that that is the case but it's also um, important to maintain the right balance uh, between balance of or between agility and process orientation uh, being elastic helps businesses, organizations, and leaders to adapt quickly. Every milestone uh, that you will encounter or that you've encountered in the past uh, brings its set of opportunities and it brings its own set of challenges. Um, and then we all know how elastic organizations emerge as winners. So the business case to stay elastic is an obvious one and one doesn't need to sort of say a lot on that. The second aspect is how elastic leaders bend and stretch with the firm. And, I, and, and as far as we are concerned, that hopefully would be one of the key takeaways for you this morning. I mean, as a leader, what changes do you need to bring to your own thinking and to your style with different milestones um, such that it does not constrain your growth? And believe me, uh, all of us, uh, including Mr. Basin, we worked with clients and we'll share some of these war stories and we see this coming up again and again that how the thinking style and 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 the way the founder leaders operate or hope to operate their businesses as they move transition from one milestone to the other that makes a big difference and we'll also talk about uh, both global as well as more importantly local experiences of with those whom, whom we worked of leaders of successful companies who do this over and over by evolving themselves with the organization and they are the ones who are successful and finally uh, what does this mean for you in the near term so as i said um, again one of the uh, uh, key takeaways for you as because as you evolve so will the nature of roles the skills and capabilities you uh, need in the future will look a lot different and believe me they will look a lot different than what you need right now and what you have right now so how do you check for the readiness of not just yourself but also for the, your team and the talent that you have i mean who will adapt quicker that's a big question than others and how can you support them to adapt that's another question that would be on the top of your mind so we are hoping uh, to answer these pertinent questions during the webinar and share real takeaways for you as leaders so that you can go back and, and think of doing something with them i mean implement in respective organizations so that's really the endeavor um so let's um, get to sort of know you uh, and like, I, but before we do that, I'd like to uh, take a few minutes to walk you through a framework, which will sort of be the anchor for a lot of a conversation. And as you can see on this graphic, 
when you look at the journey of an organization from its birth to the maturity phase uh, we've seen and 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 more and plenty of that that organizations go through these transitions and these transitions are in terms of the business model the organization structure the control systems processes and 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 importantly and last but not the least as they would say the management style of leaders leading these organizations and they all transition they have to change with the you know the stage at which you are so allow me a couple of minutes to walk you through this fundamental framework and we will then set up and i know mr basin i'm jumping the um, the timer we'll then set up a menti.com uh, to get to understand from you as to where do you find yourself on these sort of stages uh, this is the griner's growth model those from the academia would be familiar with this um and as i'm not i'm going quickly going to sort of walk you through or talk you through you know each of the stages so that the framework has some sort of a um a bedding in if you like um and and you see it goes from birth to sort of reinvent in the birth phase uh, the focus is on creation of product and the market structures and organization communications are informal ownership is highly leveraged as a reward for talent and then you move to the sustained growth as you would expect the focus shifts to efficiency uh, preparation for scaling up the organization or the business starts to sh shape to more formal structures and processes uh, incentives and budget controls become important so as to maintain the balance of burning cash for scaling and meeting key expenses and i can i have some very close up personal examples of um, sort of burning out during the sustain phase and maybe we'll talk about some of our own personal examples of being investees in some startups um, and then you move on to the expansion phase where the business starts to focus on more products or service lines or newer markets and then again we see the structures getting more decentralized you would see that business metrics and that's really the first time metrics suddenly become important <clears throat> they begin they start to get evaluated for different products and services service lines or markets and this is possibly also the stage where we see profit centers coming up um performance wise focus is now on rewarding individuals and creating differentiation for performance keywords and we should be sort of uh, focusing on what each of these words mean because differentiating for performance while is the science is a difficult art to practice and and we can if anybody is interested we can go down that sort of path and talk about more you then move on to the institutionalized phase uh, that's where consolidation happens as you would expect so there's more centralization so you would have a centralized office with possibly key functions and then remote teams um, for your markets or products and service lines etc um, the central office acts more as a controller monitor centrally um, this is the stage where organization aligns its um partners or employees if you like to use the word to longer term growth plans through stock options and profit sharing and you know all of those schemes begin to sort of become relevant and uh, make sense and then you get into the reinvent which is really the final stage uh, where we see metrics teams emerge teams or squads as you might like to you know be more familiar with our form basis objectives and team members may come from different departments and functions importantly teams collective outcomes are given more importance over individual performance um the founder or the ceo and or the ceo as the case may be start to have an oversight on the business with their leadership teams running it the founder and or the ceo focuses more towards growth innovation investing in the long term um reinvention of the company for the sustainability um so i hope that resonates i know it was a sort of quick run through uh, but i hope this resonates it's a very powerful one of the fundamental frameworks that the science of or the management science has come up in a very very long time so you are likely to see yourself 
in one of these phases or some of you uh, maybe somewhere in between two of these phases and that's how we'd like to get to know you what's important is to know where you are and where are you going towards so what we are going to be doing um, mr basin if you may please no thank you very much um, so tell us in what phase do you find yourself in currently so use your smartphones um, yeah, I mean, every phone is a smart today, smart one today. So I don't know why we say smartphones. So use your phones. Uh, go to menti.com and select one of the phases that is the closest match to your current growth of phase for your organization. And what you see on the slide is the um, the code, which is 9589054. So, and Mr. Basin will monitor this live. So please go to uh, menti.com on your smartphones. Enter the code 9589054. And choose the phase that is the closest match to your current growth phase. And if you feel that you are between two phases, choose the one phase where you see greater affinity. So, so if you're leaning towards one, pick that up. Wow. Well, Okay, interesting. Nikhil Konika, yeah, I mean, sixty-seven yeah. percent of so, are in the birth stage. Yeah, Absolutely. no, I think our, uh, this sort of aligns very well with our hypothesis, uh, Deepak. So I think while the results are as expected and not surprising, uh, it is clear that many of your companies uh, or you know the, the people in the audience are either transitioning or have recently transitioned from one phase to another. I think a lot of them in the birth phase have an aspiration that very soon they will be transitioning to the sustained growth phase. Uh, so I believe this is a good segue into our next section, uh, which focuses on the management systems and therefore the leadership archetypes that will be needed as these companies transition from you know phase one to two. Right, absolutely. So thank you very much. Um, but maybe we'll pick this up later on. So this 67 and 33, um, what does that sort of total up to in, in real value terms? I mean, off the, I don't know, uh, well, we have a very thin uh, audience as of now, but out of the 19, you know, what does that 67 and what does that 33 uh, person sort of represent? But we'll pick that up later on. Um, Mr. Basin, if you can, or is Go that back. something on my screen? Yep, there we go. Thank you very much. Right. So thank you, Nikhil, uh, for sort of taking us to this very nice segue. Uh, and again, a self-evident visual uh, that you can uh, see here. And essentially, the key message here is that typically different styles are required from leaders at different stages. Um, and I'll just sort of, I'm not going to run through all five and maybe just pick on the first one and then possibly talk about the last one. Um, and, and you would expect this. I mean, you know, 67% of you uh, are at the birth stage. The leader's type is very informal. Uh, the focus is on getting the minimal viable product or service ready and... Wow, I can hear myself. So is that a is that a clone of me somewhere? No, I think there's a bit of an echo deeper. Yeah, You're all of a sudden. It sort of kicked in all of a sudden. So I don't know why. Maybe. maybe. I think we're maybe. supposed to try to mute ourselves and uh, only Deepa can talk. I think, yeah. We Am I that loud that you guys can pick up my sound in your respective offices? <laughs> anyway, so let me not lose time here. So, I mean, like the 67% of you who said you are in the birth stage, and I'm sure this will resonate with you. Um, the focus is on getting the minimal viable sort of product or service ready, launch, and start preparation for growth and start prepping for growth. Um, 
and you would find those of you who are in that birth uh, sort of stage or phase you would find yourself taking on multiple jobs uh, with often lack of clarity in structure or even well defined accountabilities i mean uh, you pretty much do everything that needs to be done but if you were to sort of transition over to let's say um, stage 5 or, or phase 5 um, this is where uh, team you would have a team of sort of functional and all business unit leaders to manage the business the leaders would require more of a participative oversight um and as we said earlier the focus is on reinventing the organization and, and the leaders step in mostly when there are conflicts so we can transition to the next one uh, mr basi so what's important here yes it's important to understand that you have that every business will go through that transition from you know the informal to the directive delegative and so on and so forth but what's really critical to understand is that transitioning between these phases the leaders will face some or the other crisis where it will require them to stretch and and therefore the need for them to become agile and adapt their styles of leading the organization becomes critical so and and just to sort of bring some of our own research into play basis the work that we do whether it's across executive search or whether it's in the advisory side of a business fundamentally we've seen two sort of broad personas archetypes that or whichever word that you uh, like to pick play out in these phases we call the first one as the activator so activator is a persona or an archetype who is able to get the job done and in the initial phases uh, is successful as she or he is not hesitant in getting hands dirty and gets action oriented in driving the results versus the second persona which is that of a connector um there are leaders who, who focus on building the connection they would try to align multiple stakeholders keeping the teams together engaged but end up making a lot of promises sometimes and it's quite possible we've seen that some of which they may not be able to keep so these are two sort of um archetypes and depending on the stage at which you are or you are as in both you as a leader and as well as your enterprise um you would have to sort of switch uh, between these archetypes so let me bring in nikhil uh, here to share some examples of these two types of leadership styles from his own experience and how do these styles play out and what could be some of the challenges that these leaders might face so nikhil yeah thanks deepa yeah i think uh, just to sort of add to what deepak is just describing i think it's it's very important for us to be cognizant of the transitions that one needs to make as their companies grow from strength to strength uh, you know there are quite a few interesting iconic companies that have been very successful in making those transitions uh, i want to highlight those first and then sort of share a little more color from our experience by working with a startup uh, here in india uh, let me take the example of apple uh, you know a well known industry giant uh, you know an icon created by an iconic leader like steve jobs now jobs was clearly a y type leader uh, you know y types are visionaries uh, they are great optimists uh, who believe that uh, you know their job is to basically take a vision uh, which could be even unrealistic and make the possibilities happen and he was that kind of a leader right uh, almost a control freak uh, let me not use the word narcissistic but again he was someone who would really establish a very very strong vision and you know and go all out in executing that uh, but he couldn't have done that without the help and realism of steve wozniak uh, whom all of us know uh, was a great technologist uh, you know if steve was steve jobs was a why uh, steve wozniak was actually the how behind it right he would deliver the goods and he would actually create a very pragmatic view to what steve really wanted to deliver right and both complemented each other really really well 
uh, in those, let's say, the formative or the reshaping years of Apple, right? Um, so that's that's one example. I think the second example that sort of brings this framework to light uh, is the Bill Gates and Steve Ballmer example. Uh, again, if anyone reads studies about Bill Gates' thought process mindset, uh, he continues to be a techie at heart, right? Uh, there are documentaries on him which say that you know he would enjoy coding, uh, you know, through the hours uh, in a day, almost spending 20 to 22 hours just coding the operating systems that he want, wanted to launch in the market. There came a point where he very quickly realized for a company like Microsoft to grow and sustain its growth, they needed someone who came with a strong management system thinking uh, behind that. And that's when he hired Steve Ballmer, uh, who was a Harvard graduate, uh, was pursuing his MBA at Stanford, uh, Bill pulled him out of his MBA course and actually got him to run Microsoft who later on became the CEO of that company and ran it uh, for many, many years successfully. Of course, now Microsoft has taken a different spin with Satya coming on, uh, com coming on to lead the company. But the point here is that most successful companies, uh, you know, they identify complementary leaders uh, who bring in complementary skill sets and competencies to make that company grow in a very successful way. And that's extremely important. And when you're on a growth path, it's very easy to lose sight of that and continue to run the show that way you have been when you actually launch your first product in the marketplace. Uh, but being cognizant that things would change, the market would change, the customer requirements would change, the expectations of stakeholders of the company would change, uh, mean that you will have to actually bring on different kind of leaders uh, on board to actually execute on your strategy. Uh, an example closer to home in India, uh, we work very closely with a food tech startup. And again, the story is quite similar, even though the scale is much smaller than the two examples that I just described. Uh, the two founders really complement each other well. One uh, happens to be what, uh, what Deepak described is a perfect example of an activator who focuses on operations, sourcing, uh, finance, etc. So very sound functionally on how the company operates, whereas the co-founder uh, is a great collaborator and is completely focused on innovation, driving new products and customer experience. So they gel very well in ensuring that both sides of the coin are sort of you know, well aligned to the strategy of the company and taking that startup forward. Uh, additionally, uh, you know, this is purely based on our experience in the recent years, uh, what we believe Companies of different sizes, whether large, mid-size or small, uh, the role of a chief operating officer or a chief business officer, or in many cases, a chief transformation officer has become increasingly critical. While the CEO focuses on what I describe a zoom out strategy, keeping an eye on the future, what's going to happen in the next 12 to 18 months, uh, the CBO or the chief operating officer becomes a leveler who focuses on the zoom in part of the strategy, brings in the right management controls, brings in the right principles of management that help to execute the strategy in the short term. And I think that balance is becoming extremely important for organizations. Gone are the days when companies actually do a three-year business plan, right? Uh, I've grown as a strategy consultant and most of my clients 10 years ago used to help, used to seek our help in coming up with a three-year or five-year business plan. All of that has now gone up the window because things are so changing so fast. The world is getting disrupted at a pace that is completely unprecedented. It's all about zooming, it for, zooming out for the next six months and then zooming in on the initiatives that can actually take the company to the next level. Uh, yeah, over to you, Deepak. No, thank you very much, Nikhil. And you're right. You know, the the Indian sort of food tech startup is is a great example of, you know, how do you bring those two archetypes together, and they can really create magic. I'm going to very quickly, Mr. Basin, if you, yeah, very quickly pivot to the next and and invite Konika to share her experiences of, you know. Um, what kind of leadership style she sees operating, let's say, in the mature phase, which is when you're transitioning from a stage four to a stage five. So, Konika, would you like to yeah. talk about a bit more? 
Sure, sure, Deepak. Thank you so much. And I think uh, Nikhil has set the context very well. And I think I'll just pick it up from there. Now, what happens and relating it with the with the two personality types or archetypes that we are talking about, which is an activator as well as a connector. Now, what really we have seen, and I can talk more about it with examples, uh, more related with the startup world is. Now, the, when we talk about the activators, since you know they are the ones which are those go-getters, getting their hands dirty, uh, getting into everything from an operational perspective. What happens with them when we when we come to stage four or stage five? And I think it's very important for. all our participants today who are in those one two or maybe some of them are in that three also right now is that they tend to the activators tend to do most of the heavy lifting you know so they they get used to the fact that everything yeah. has to be done by them mm. um on the contrary what happens with the connectors is like what you had mentioned uh, they develop teams in the initial phase uh they tend to make a lot of promises they are all you know all out in terms of putting the people the clients the relationships and everything together and uh, uh somewhere in those mature phases uh you find that they get into a kind of a lock or a deadlock because they don't have enough people they don't have enough leaders they've ended up hiding doers uh and people who are just executing their vision more than anything else and um, uh, we've had many such examples uh, where and i'll i'll particularly talk about uh, one of uh, uh, one of my own client which is in the rcm space so which is you know essentially again tech enabled services which we'll talk about they started the company in 2005 uh, they've grown to a level of 2000 over the last 15 years and very good example of coming in stage 4 Uh, uh from where they had started uh now the beauty is that the co-founders are also brothers now and they happen to be uh, you know when we talk about it that the two of them demonstrate these two personalities now what happens is uh something hit us and while for the world covid has been very bad i think for them it has been the reverse like we have seen with zooms and all of the world where business catapulted their business catapulted and suddenly the demand that they had was to literally hire thousand more people now they didn't have anyone to do that so and they were not prepared for it they kept you know putting that in the back burner assuming that you know they both can kind of manage it and they have enough leaders um and unfortunately the leaders while they are very good in terms of execution but they are not good in terms of being a overall holistic person to really run the company for them so that's where i'll bring in what nikhil was mentioning how important it is to have that right. um, yeah. head of operations or a coo kind of a role and that's where we have been, we we were speaking to them fortunately since i know both the co-founders very well they had been speaking to me for a while um uh, and um, i think it was timing was perfect where we started speaking and you know uh looking at people who could actually take this baton on from them and it frees up time for both these co-founders to actually think beyond operations and getting into that local grind and now look at actually adding more business lines for them to really take up so like ex- the example that you are talking about you know at that watchdog watchdog space to getting into more of a participative kind of a mode where they say okay we are like true leaders and let some of these uh you know the cxo minus ones that we kind of hire take on that heavy lifting from us you know even getting an hr head in place for that matter even that is something they struggled with because they didn't know how to hire those 1000 people so i think mm-hmm. we have many such examples i don't think we are at any given point in time are saying that you know being a activator or a connector is a good or bad i think what is important is we need both these styles and i think because both the styles yeah. were present they were able to evolve to the level that they did and in fact they are doing better than some of the multinational firms today in india you know and and going global so they have a huge presence in the us they have a huge presence here in india so absolutely i think um, uh, so that's 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 one example i thought i'll i'll share with it over to you deepak 
Yeah, no, thank you very much, Konika, Nikhil, and I, yeah, I mean, it, it's a sort of bang on point. Uh, it's not about one over the other or one is right or the other is wrong. It's really about balance. And since, um, and this is also a fact, and, and again, I go back to that 67 or 3 person that said that we are in the birth phase. And, I sh and I'm hoping that this realization is already there, that each one of us can't possibly do everything on our own. Um, and therefore, the need to focus on building our own sort of muscle or leadership muscle or whatever word you want to use and building the right team for the future becomes absolutely important as you and you will experience these challenges or crisis as you start transition from one phase to the other. Therefore, uh, you know, this higher right, um, search and assess, follow the data and the science um, is is spot on. Um, and again, I would invite, you know, Konika to maybe very quickly talk about one of their experiences um, with one of you, and I'm talking now to you audience, one of you who may be sitting in the audience or maybe is not sitting in the audience, but that's a real life and as close as it can get example. Absolutely. So, Konika? Absolutely. And I don't know, Sahir, if you're there in the audience or not, and I don't mean to embarrass you. I, I don't think he's even prepared that, uh, you know, that's, that's what's going to pop up. But uh, I think he's a perfect example. So Smokescreen, it's, it's one of the members uh, today of the forum that we are speaking about. I think we started our conversation with uh, Sahir and the team in 2019 when they were, you know, actually getting into a global setup. And uh, um, I, I think very earlier on, I would say, and compliment them in terms of how they realize that there are certain skill sets which are extremely critical for them to hire, um, where, you know, we kind of helped uh, him as well as Ravi Raj Doshi, who is the CTO to get a chief marketing officer and a sales head. Uh, the sales head, obviously, with the experience of enterprise sales. And I think they were examples of hiring for the future. So Deepak, to add on to your point, hiring right is important, but hiring for the future, keeping your vision in mind is also very, very important. In fact, there was a lot of learning agility that I saw that got demonstrated by them because when we got into you know, the designing phase and looking at the talent, there were a lot of tweaks that, they, that kind of came in. And um, I think most important is when you're hiring, you have to look at your startup, you have to look at your vision and what you tend to achieve. A lot of times we get clients where, you know, they tend to go with what happens in the market. Um, and, 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 you know, um, I think that's where the team created that specific skill sets, which were more suited for smoke screen. And um, we, we kind of get got the, the digital marketing person as well as the salesperson on board. So, um, so absolutely, and um, yeah. Yeah. So I, no, I great, a great <laughs> yeah, great story. Thank you for sharing, and uh, and I hope we didn't embarrass um, uh, Sahir, who may or may not be in the audience. So uh, I'd also like to very quickly sort of uh, get Nikhil to share his um, you know experience on this need to differentiate between uh, performance and potential. I mean both, and the reason I'm leaning towards Nikhil and Konica is because, I mean, they do this 24 by 7. Well, I wouldn't say 24 by 7, but they do that. This is this is who they are. And when they engage with clients, whether these are startup organizations or, or mature organizations, being able to differentiate between performance and potential is absolutely critical. So, Nikhil, would you want to sort of quick two cents? Sure. Sure, absolutely, Deepak. You know, uh, uh, at this sort of stage, you know, I, I think this is an important sort of slide because it talks about building a right team, right? And I want to sort of bring in a slightly provocative view uh, from our experience, right? As even Konica sort of alluded, um, more than two thirds of hiring that happens even today across different company sizes, whether it's large, medium, small, is still very experience and competency based, right? Uh, most 
testing methodologies, most interview techniques are based on what candidates really have done in the past, right? And if they bring in the right technical skills, if they have delivered successfully in the past, uh, that candidate would actually go to the next stage and probably be given an offer. And I think that's where leadership teams who are responsible for hiring get it wrong, right? Uh, from our experience, and this is backed by a lot of data and analytics, uh, it's about looking for the potential. And what we believe there are four sort of defining parameters that decide whether a leader or, or a professional is actually set for success in the future. Number one is curiosity, uh, where a person has a childlike curiosity to learn new things. Uh, the world around us is changing so fast. Unless the leader brings in that level of curiosity, which is way high, uh, he or she is not going to be successful. The second is motivation, uh, ability to take on assignments that are going to be stretched, uh, ability to actually bend towards complex tasks and deliver them successfully uh, requires a, a, a really high stated motivation. Uh, level of engagement, I think that's extremely important. Uh, small uh, you know, or large companies today work in a matrixed uh, format. So when you think about working across stakeholders, navigating the complex, complex organization structures, you need someone who comes, when, comes in with a high level of empathy and engagement. And uh, whether you're dealing externally or internally, I think that's another important uh, factor. Last but not the least uh, is about adaptability, right? The world we live in demands leaders to be very flexible and therefore, you know, the, the theme of a presentation, which is about bending and stretching, I think unless you're testing for adaptability, you're actually not going to bring in the right leader. Uh, therefore, I just want to sort of summarize by saying that the focus needs to shift from what we call what leaders do to who leaders are. And there are ample amount of frameworks, including a Conferi's four-dimensional leadership framework uh, that does exactly that. It tests how leaders are and helps them to really, you know, uh, assess on the uh, on the requirements of a role or a particular job. Deepak, over to you. Deepak, I think you're on mute. My apologies. So yeah. I'm saying no, thank you, Nikhil. So while we don't want to sort of pitch for Conferi frameworks, but and and yes, there is the Conferi framework, but there there are plenty more out available. Absolutely. The important point is that you know, um, as as you transition uh, from your birth to the next stage, and as you start building your teams, use the data, use the science. Um, today, given you know where technology is, and you guys know this better than anyone else the whole assessment technology has leapfrogged those of us who are outside operate in this business are already on the fourth generation um, so please use the data and the science to build your teams because it is absolutely uh, uh, inevitable and and the more we stress this point the less justice we are doing that as you transition from each phase there are challenges so for example from the birth to the sustained growth phase and mr bassini would have to probably click here yeah, thank you very much um you will find the challenge of you know uh, finding the right team formalizing the process the communication and working towards efficiency i mean if you were to look at from expansion to into institutionalization the balance of being agile maintaining scale of growth and still bringing in order to the madness becomes important and in fact at this juncture i'd like to and i'm going to quote um what steve blank i don't know if you're familiar with this name um he wrote the book the startup owner's manual um he's a respected educator and an entrepreneur in his own rights uh, he defines a startup as a temporary organization in search of a scalable repeatable profitable business model 
And then he goes on to say, and I quote, once a startup finds and successfully demonstrates a business model, it transforms into a more structured corporation and, and this is critical, and sadly loses some of its startup DNA. So that balance that, you know, uh, how do I remain agile yet maintain scale becomes critical. And then, of course, um, you know, the challenges of the re-infant phase are, are obvious and I don't need to. So the point uh, that we're trying to sort of drive home uh, with some level of emphasis is that growth and transitions across phases seem challenging. And it is challenging. It doesn't seem challenging. It is challenging. It will be challenging. Um, but there are examples enough and more, both at the global level as well as at the local level. When I say local, I mean India, um, who, which have done it very successfully. And again, a good segue for me to sort of zip up and invite Nikhil because he's worked with a couple of these organizations. Um, and I'm going to invite Nikhil to sort of talk us through these four that you see. These are well-known, uh, what do you call them, unicorns? Uh, and then maybe some more examples from Nikhil's own experience. Sure. Thanks, Deepak. Yeah, I think uh, so. These are some interesting examples of companies, and I'm sure there are many more. Uh, but the reason why we want to put them up were, was that all of these companies, at some point in this stage, uh, have pivoted uh, to new business models, uh, new organization structures, uh, while not changing the fundamental DNA of being very, very agile and innovative. Uh, Take example of Spotify, which is one of the world's premium uh, streaming service provider. All of us know about Net Netflix and their pivot from being a DVD rental service provider to a OTT uh, platform almost created a new market segment, uh, you know, when everyone was still hooked on to cable or, or dish. Uh, I mean, Amazon, I think everyone knows about it. Uh, there's enough written about, you know, the culture of uh, customer centricity, obsessiveness about a customer, how they really believe in the fail fast and fail first principle and so on and so forth. Uh, I want to highlight Dyson as an example. Uh, you know, when you think about the product categories they are in, uh, you know, they're clearly not in the, the most sexy product categories, right? Who could have thought that a product like a hairdryer or a vacuum cleaner can become an aspirational product, right? And, uh, you know, kudos to the kind of innovation that they do, uh, you know, in products, the kind of technology that they deploy in the products. Uh, they've made products that are, that are uh, purely coincidental and mainstream, made them very, very aspirational even for a normal consumer. I uh, want to deep, uh, sort of dive into Spotify a little bit to give you a little more color into how they do things uh, in their organization. So I believe Spotify owes its success uh, to its deeply rooted agile methodologies and its ability to scale agile across the organization. Uh, so they have clearly integrated agile way of working into the core of the organization. I think one of the key success factors is what they call agile engineering culture, uh, which focuses strategically on deploying individuals or tribes or scrums, as we call it in agile. And that really keeps employees engaged and also anticipate changes very, very quickly uh, as the way of working involves. Oh, so in the interest of time i'm just going to skip over some of the details but clearly when you think about their working culture i think the results in having the following benefits i think this enhanced velocity of what they're able to deliver to the market so the number of features that they are able to come up with is probably the best in the industry when you think about process bottlenecks they are reduced to a minimum uh, when you think about minimizing dependencies they have on various cross-functional uh, uh, facets of the organization. All of that is completely minimized. Uh, there's a very elastic 
firm structure that makes problem solving a lot more easier. Uh, so it's an example of a company that works with minimum control, a lot of flexibility, uh, but raises sharp focus on what they're delivering, delivering to their customer from a platform standpoint. Thanks, Nikhil. Also, yeah, I, no, thank I you. I get Amazon example because we're close to 50 minutes. We should yes. probably give some time back to the audience for Q&A. Right. No, I'm aware of that. Thank you very much, Nikhil. Uh, and for sort of, so very quickly, um, and we will, like I said earlier, share these slides back with you. So two critical messages. I mean, the how of bending and stretching as leaders is really sort of moving from the T model to the Tetris model, which is being an expert at one thing to transitioning to becoming good enough at many things. Now, uh, what's the uh, underlying recipe, the, the success mantra in, in doing this? It all boils down to agility or being agile. Mr. Basin, if you get there, you go. And I know we sort of consume more time than we should have. Um, would have loved to speak about all of these elements and happy to re-engage at whatever point in time. And, and it's just not, I mean, yes, of course, Conferry was really the first of the block to talk about agility from a science point of view before it's a, we started commercializing it. Um, but there are, it, it, I mean, it is beyond, let's say, proving today, which is that agility is that one single line uh, factor which will allow you to sort of make that transition from the T to the Tetris model. It is about self-awareness and um, the more you think about it, the more you realize that how critical it is. Self-awareness, not, not in terms of attaining moksha, one is not at all sort of suggesting that, but self-awareness more in terms of really getting a very good grip of understanding who you are and goes back to the point that Nikhil made when he talked about Conferry 4D. It's important for us leaders to understand who we really are. What are our insecurities? What are our strengths? And, and what is it that we are good at? What is it that we can't do? Because if there's something that we can't do, then we've got to bring in complementary skills. And that's the awareness that becomes critical. It is also about people agility. It's people agility is about being able to work with people who are different from me. And, and yet being able to deliver enterprise performance. So, so this is absolutely critical. Um, and, and, you know, uh, learning agility is the, is the, is the, um, it's a secret recipe. I would have loved to invite Nikhil and Konica to talk about, uh, you know, their experiences with CXOs, but mindful of time. So, um, I'm going to, Sorry, Nikhil. Sorry, Konika. Uh, no, maybe no, we can pick... let's open it up. Yeah, yeah. Let's yeah. let's hear from uh, the rest We'll of quickly it. sort of go into uh, the Q and A section. But what is it that you can do? Yes, focus on self awareness. Yes, focus on change agility, people agility, and so on and so forth. But sitting behind this are some very um, simple steps. Right. Um, many years ago, and this goes back 15 years ago, when uh, I was actually in a in a in an academic conference talking about agility, and one of the co-presenters he says, "I started. I work with agility as a concept, but I was an agile. So you know what he did? He started uh, taking to sort of cross-country hiking, and he just his name is John John Scott." Um, and he would just throw himself into these unknown situations and, and, you know, come out of the other end. So what is it? What are the steps that you can take? Very simple. Get feedback from everyone and make that as part of your sort of uh, daily, well, not daily, but make this, as, make this as part of your routine. Uh, move out of your comfort zone find those stretch assignments, you know, so people went cross country. When I say cross country, I mean, you know, inter country. So you would start from one country and the fellow would hike across to, you know, three different countries. Um, yeah, I mean, maybe take to become a hog member, take to riding super bikes, like some of us got into. Um, the sense idea is get out of your comfort zone. 
work with a coach there's 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 um, there are certified coaches out there who help uh, set up top teams we're not selling coaching but there is merit and i can very quickly bring in personal example uh, some of us on this call on this webinar we are working with one of perhaps one of the bigger biggest i don't know uh, e tailors in the country and and we see this this is not theoretical it's come out of our own experience yes we've couched it in a language which is um, easier to transmit but i work with two of their top executives and the issues are the same the issues are that i'm not able to move out of my expert my own identity as an expert wherein my role calls me to lead a thousand team member a thousand member team across multiple geographies and that's leading to issues in the organization it's leading to delays when it comes to product launches it it it's leading to a completely manic lifestyle three weeks ahead of you know a big event that's likely to come up around the corner so find a coach you know before some of these behaviors get very strongly inbuilt they they become they become more hardwired than just neurist just just heuristics and finally tap into the ecosystem learn from big and small players speak with each other immersions are a great way so i'm going to quickly stop and um um hand it over back to miss jain sonam and see if uh, i know we just four minutes but happy to stay on for another 10 15 minutes if the audience yeah. has any questions for us sure i mean what a show thank you so much i, I really enjoyed myself uh, learning about different uh, experiences <laughs> that you guys had and you know from my own experience uh, you know sometime back when i was talking to a startup uh there was a technology guy who was a ceo and there was a sales person and uh, they said you know what do you need of a marketing person in the, in the team or what's the need of you know we can just hire some intern uh for the time being and get the work done so i could really resonate when konika said that hire people from the futuristic perspective that you know in the long run uh, what you really need uh, in an organization so i'll uh, i'll put that i'll quickly forward to the q and a questions um So there is one question. Uh, it says, uh, "Coaching Guy Kawasaki is principle of niche Thai sales. Uh, we see a lot of startups operating in a very specific segment, uh, finding and matchmaking uh, the most relevant re human resources for these startups is a Herculean task. So how can this be addressed?" Well, my two bits. Um, while I respect the choice of word Herculean task. but it's not sort of uh, a task that can't be brought to fruition um, you may be looking for specific skills and that's something that nikhil and konika can comment about the availability of skills and so on and so forth but if you have those skills how do you bring those people on is is eminently doable there's lots of science the and the key message is follow the data follow the science but over to konika and nikhil Yeah, thanks, Deepak. I think a brilliant question, uh, and I'm glad that this has really come up because um, uh, you know when we say niche, uh, honestly, that is what the world is about today. Today, the world is all about creating the expertise. I will link it back with a couple of things Deepak and Nikhil spoke about, and that's why we are saying you have to look at potential. if you are doing something new you will not necessarily have that available in the market but you have to see who are the people who possess that kind of skill potential which will help you achieve that and that's where you know you need experts helping you in terms of identification of some of these talents which are competency based models specific to your organization so so sonam for example you took an example of a marketing manager uh and i spoke about smoke screen you know with with sahir aurya now i can't just say uh, any uh, head of digital marketing who is doing the rest of the work will fit in smoke screen which is a cyber security company we had to design a framework and identify people which were suiting their requirement and that's where we ex we as experts come in because what is our job you know or, or any other for that matter it is about knowing people it's and to uh, deepak's point it is about data it's about analytics it is looking at potential talent 
there's an interesting question from uh, Mr. Prakash and he says and Nikhil you might may or may not want to and what would be the question is and what would be the ratio of product managers and engineers oblique coders in an elastic team in a general parlance well um, <laughs> that's a giving a specific answer to that is going to be difficult Prakash but I guess it would boil down to um, what what is way you are in your business and what is it that you are presenting to the world outside to your consumers so if you are saying that um, my business is really about building products right now then obviously you need to have your engineers and coders in place but if you've reached the stage where you are saying okay i've got to either take this to the market or i need to be looking at an outside in view then you've got to have those product managers in place um, what exactly is the ratio will depend on the scale that you are following the the geos or the markets that you are present in but that's my two bits nickel you probably oh. be better place to comment no, absolutely. I think I, I sort of agree with you. Just wanted to add a few points. I think it's it's difficult to sort of give a ratio to this, uh, Anand. Uh, I think what's important to understand is where in the evolution are you from an organization standpoint? Typically, startups who are in the birth phase, according to the framework that Deepak shared, tend to be more inward looking because your your main objective is to build that great product, which receives this uh, accept acceptability in the marketplace, right? And you typically have one or two customers who have bought in and are using your uh, using your product or using your features. Uh, when you pivot to the next phase, that's when you start uh, gaining a lot more acceptance by more number of customers. That's when you need a lot more outside in validation of your roadmap. And therefore the importance of having a product manager uh, who keeps the product strategy in the mind from a from a roadmap standpoint? I think uh, the the importance of that cannot be overstated. So that's extremely important. Uh, I would also add another dimension to this. Uh, also keep a view of having a customer success organization in place, where you have someone who's actually uh, analytically looking at what features are being consumed by your customer, whether those features are being overused, underused, uh, do you need to tweak your, your feature set? Uh, that can only be done by someone who really understands customer success uh, really well. Uh, from some of our clients, uh, you know, in the hyperscaler world, uh, like the Amazons of the world, uh, you would know that having a very, very solid and a mature customer success organization uh, is key to their uh, their value proposition. Hope that. And I helped. hope, yeah, no, and I hope Anand that also responds to the second. I think it's a follow-on question, which says that how important it is for deep tech startups to have technical managers, stroke leaders, compared to program managers, who sort of are generalists while scaling your team. So, um, I hope it sort of answers, but you could pop in an email if you want to speak with Nikhil or any one of us and and have a chat around this and are there any more questions now they aren't really yeah i think that's the last question very well thank you very much uh dsci sonam and team um and I say this on Mr. Basin, behalf of Mr. Basin, Konica and Nickel, we've enjoyed ourselves, uh, you know, engaging, even though it was a small audience. Uh, um, but look forward to another opportunity where we have a larger audience because we are absolutely sure and not just convinced that um, the for any startup to it's important to understand and and proactively in fact be cognizant of the fact that as they grow they will they will have to go through those transitions and at every transition they will meet some challenges the more um cognized they are to prep for it as opposed to prepping for something like this once they've been hit by that transition 
so with those few words uh, very good afternoon and thank you very much once again thank you everybody thank you so much thanks, everyone. Everyone. Bye. thank you so much thanks everybody bye thank you so much bye thank you so much the con ferry team to join us for the webinar today thank you bye thank you bye 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 bye